Yeah, we, we lived a few houses up there on Benefit Street. You know, oh, one on the corner of Benefit and Star. A dreadful green now. Well, Francis, yes, he left Brown. And we struggled after my graduation. Uh, jobs were scarce. Uh, my portrait business was slow. Advertising in Newport and New York was just futile. And it was post-war reception, World War I. And everyone was struggling. Those colored folks that had come up north looking for jobs were struggling. But they had brought all kinds of new ways and music and Harlem Renaissance was just beginning. Oh, there was new music, there was new artists and writers and performers and filmmakers and the only work that I was allowed to do in Providence was domestic work, sometimes stenographer, and oh, catering. I call it serving white folks as parties. <laughs> but suddenly, suddenly I was asked to exhibit a painting at an exhibit. I, and I was asked that at the opening reception, that I not stand beside my work. My people had powered and built this country with their sweat and blood and lives. And yet, my African negritude and my Indian blood were unacceptable. Hmm. So, 1922, 57 years, after the emancipation, with the help of one of the nation's most elite white artists, art patron, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. I turned my lovely black backside on this country and went to Paris to study among the greats, where blacks were allowed to flourish their art. And it was all quite a story. Quite a journey, in and out of Paris, in and out of Paris. I noted some in a diary, and some I draw on here, and some, oh, from my heart. My heart, my heart. To genius, each hour, each minute we live must be registered on the record of time so beautifully lived, so powerfully lived, that this whole human race for centuries without limit to come may look thereon and find no shameful trace, no violation of God's law, no mutilation of the sacred creed of beauty. Every divine faculty developed to its highest cultural extent I arrived in Paris, 1922, August 11th, alone. Now, I've saved $1,000. Today, $14,000. But however, after loaning half to a worthless brother and <laughs> expenses, passage, and whatnot, I was left when well, my fortune was reduced to $380. Today, that would be over $5,000 to live in Paris for a year. <clears throat> Today, in Paris, a tiny walk-up, one room walk-up with bare amenities was over $1,000 a month. So I was not going to last three months. But still, I engaged a studio, 36 Avenue de Chatignon, and immediately just fell into bed half dead. When I could stand, I went to work immediately. I went to work with a, a calm assurance and a savage pleasure. This was going to be a, a living thing, a master stroke. And my arms, they took on their own rhythm, yes, powerfully putting upon the clay. And this was two months, a morning, and a month, all day, for two months, two weeks before it was done. Money was all spent. But I was even more determined, so I worked those two weeks without food for the first time in my life. 
I was hungry. But I was working in a studio of a young woman. And of course, it was much better life there. <laughs> she was a student at Les Hauts de Beaux She was studying Les Hauts de Beaux Arts. When I was there, there were that little teas and cakes and whatever. <laughs> she kept up such a gay chat and laughter. It left me empty. But that must have showed because suddenly the teas and the cakes, no more. <laughs> no more teas and cakes. Well, one morning when she Warner. went off to school, <laughs> I stole. <laughs> I stole meat and potato from the dish of the dog who ate very well. Ruff, ruff, ruff. <laughs> well, I entered my call to Bozar. The Academy of Painting to the Sculpture of the Academy of Painting and Sculpture. And well, private classes were paid for, for by Gertrude Whitney. Ah, oh, what a patron. <laughs> I had studied with the great Aunt Was Sigolfan, sculptor of renown. And between 1922 and 1925, I completed two busts. <coughs> and I went on to do more. But out of pure weakness and stupidity, I invited the man I married. Well, he was a good man. But it was without hope, without ambition, and of a fearful nature. And then two of us, now to live in the remains of $380 at that time, two of us in a strange land, neither knowing the language. Well, I moved to a shack in the zone. It was a lowly, filthy section on the outside, outside the walls of Paris. And the proprietor gave him a position with a small wage mental and spiritual strength is greater through the physical. Mental and spiritual strength is greater through the physical. Yes. A busted wood was accepted in Salon d'Automne, 1924. The Autumn Salon had been in Paris since 1903. Well, by 1925, I was 35. I was ill from overwork. I was difficult living, malnutrition. My legs collapsed when I stood. There was a year, year of sleepless nights. And I was still at the Côte de Beaux Arts, studying in my afternoon and cutting stone in my studio in the afternoon. I began making batik to sell. Yes, all this in my third dwelling, that shack in the zone. You know, rag pickers and crime and, and innocent poor. Roma gypsies whose music were both delighted and deeply saddened. I planted, I cultivated winter and summer vegetables, and, but I grew weaker and weaker and weaker. And finally, a friend forced me to go to an American hospital because I'd broken down. Immediately, the doctors decided. I was a drug addict. Mm. And the nurses treated me as such. Yes. Well, rest, food for a few weeks. I was told to go home. Do not go back to work for a year, or I would be back in the hospital. But of course, I went back. The horror of that shack in the zone. So I sold my tea, and I took a six month sublet, Rue Vercingetorix. And I began, I began my first life-size statue, Volonté. Ah, oh, Volonté. Oh, English, will. Will. Oh, that I would draw on the artistry, the persistence of, of my African ancestors, my Indian ancestors. The artistry of my Narragansett Pequot ancestors was evident everywhere in their lives. <clears throat> their garments, 
pottery, daily wares, designs inspired by, fashioned from, and colored with gifts of the earth, plants, foliage, wildflowers, wondrous images of the sky, the sun, rain, the storms, lightning, creatures of the earth, skins and bones of wildlife, seashells were not tossed away after giving thanks to the inhabitants for the nutrition they delivered, but all shaped into practical and aesthetic rendering. Garments, adornment, sacred symbols honoring the spirits of the earth, wind, fire, water, all natural life. Sacred symbols attended the invocations of the spiritual leaders and healers, honored life and power regalia, prayers emanating from the dancers, the sacred decorated drums, ancient songs. Indians across this land were slaughtered by the invaders, captured, enslaved, Narragansett Pequot, Wampanoag, others sold to the Caribbean, to Europe and elsewhere. Yet, the ancient artistry is carried by the descendants across time, marking their history, their creativity, their gifts to the world. within us that wants to happen, that needs to be, the powerful urge within insisting that gives birth to art. Well, I, you know, I wasn't the first colored Indian to go to live in Europe. Edmonia Lewis, Edmonia Lewis, Chippewa, Ojibwe, free Haitian father. Uh, she was 46 years older than me. Lived most of her life in Rome, Edmonia. She was the first colored Indian to get international acclaim. Now, Rue Vesingeterates was six months sublet, and by November of 1925, I was out searching for a studio. I ran into Paul Mortier, who promised he could build a studio for me for 1,000 francs, or years right in advance. But it would be my first real studio in Paris, and to, up to that time, I had moved three times, that last time in the zone in the zone, where the water trickled down the walls in the wintertime, it froze on the walls, and the public bathrooms were so... I, I could not approach them. My stomach heaved. I, I would not go in. I never braved regularly. I, well, I was always there, torn down with melancholia, melancholia over money, money, always over money. But there is salvation in work. And that November, I picked up a man in the cafe, mm -hmm. a lovely head, and 
one morning as I shaped it, I felt the most delicious sensation of ripeness, the harmony, oh, harmony of my forces that I've been trying to attain for years. And in that time, I started my second life-size figure. He who lives and seeks beauty must acquire the power to produce it from within. He would have perfection, must attain that quality in his own creation. To attain this, one must seek as instructor the great universal creator, for only there is true power. Oh, to command and create from all that comes within the range of thought, feeling, and vision. December 8, 1925. Yes, I'm 35. The man I married, he rides with a great bunch of roses. There he lies asleep on the couch. Oh, God. Oh, God. He came drunk. I hope that I may never become a victim of envy or jealousy. It is death to the soul. You're welcome to your body. I'd rather have my mind and my soul. I admire, I appreciate the primitive beauty of a hippopotamus, but I like not his humanized descendants. <laughs> well, gone. December 22nd. I'm alone working cutting stone. I love to work alone. I feel so much in touch with myself. December 24th. Who am I? And what? I feel so terribly alone. Christmas Eve. But by March 4th, March 4th, 1926, I borrowed a thousand francs and for Paul Bourtier advance for the studio. And by uh, April, I, I was in a pitiful state. I, my feeble brain, I was not functioning as I'd like to. Two pieces were cast, and both of them a shame. Serious development. Uh, if I want to do worthy work, serious development. And yet anxieties, anxieties, and you know, the man I married lived elsewhere, but it, there's only one conduct when with a fool, and that is to be a fool. So April 30th, I have smashed up La Volonté. I must not be guilty of doing with my work, as I've too often done with people, imagining that there's something good there when there's not enough good to make it worthwhile. May, I, I took a well-needed retreat to Crotoy, the ocean. Ah, oh, ah, oh, the beautiful ocean, so peaceful. <laughs> I had been wishing for people, and I've been given the opportunity to gather my thoughts. And it was during that time when my white modernist head Silence, silence, the unifying quality of body, mind, and spirit, silence of Crotoy, and my white modernist marble head was bought by Ellen Shaw. Ellen Shaw and given to the Rhode Island School of Design Museum for their permanent collection. <laughs> but Back in Crotoy, well, oh, time dragged on. Time dragged on. I finally, I was into my new studio in Montparnasse for the next eight years. Uh -huh. My dear friend County Cullen wrote about it that it strewn was it, he said, on either side by the trampled and broken debris of 
abandoned and, and frustrated travail of many transient sculptors. Yes. Well, it was there, though, that I began poverty. With poverty now begun, I felt at home. I worked ceaselessly through summer, through the fall, with faltering, with melancholia. Ah, oh, to have been a woman <laughs> once. Because <laughs> working on poverty, I was assailed by a desire which I would not cave into without losing self-respect. It was eating into my entrails and dividing my thoughts. Whoa, desire. How commanding a force you are. How strong nature has made you. You've come without love, unmasked and unwished. Why laugh and jest with fools, only to feel ashamed of oneself when left alone? Oh, love. Love, the genie of life, the creator of dreams, the death of the will. But I felt a cold, calm indifference. There would be no more disappointment. <clears throat> I would now work to make myself ready for the real souls that I should meet. There will be no more disappointment. August 1926. Oh. I put on a lovely green silk dress. I'm sitting on the couch. I feel myself cheerily among the people and the setting that I so much love. Oh, beauty and <laughs> understanding and the feeling of, of thought and harmony. And there comes a feeling of sadness, of desolate loneliness. If all oh, how joyful it would be if these these voices, these faces, rugs and hangings would become alive instead of what misty, formless things created in living only in my imagination. And this thing, this thing started at my feet and began to creep up and up to, up, up to my neck and soon it will cover my head. Oh God, the smothering blanket of reality. September. 19, 1926, I'm 36. How swiftly the happy days slip by. Unhappy ones linger and drag. Almost a month is fled, a month of battles fought, and won with all the glory that comes with success. Days of spiritual freedom, days of harmony in body and soul, Days when the body was healthy and heard. Days of passion and desire. Days of sadness and joy. Days of laughter and days of tears. Nights of sweet sleep and pleasant awakening. Days of plenty and days of want. Poverty. The curse of jingles. Oh, poverty. How you trail behind me, ever screeching out your presence. Think you to ever make me a subject of your kingdom? Never. Though I die of hunger, I will never bend a knee to your majesty. And yet what new forms of poverty are there for me to learn? Oh, hmm. Going without eating, that's common. <clears throat> to regain my health and strength, only to lose it again through fasting, it comes as a periodical occurrence so frequent that it neither interests nor frightens me. So poverty, weary not yourself trying to humiliate me. Poverty, <laughs> your grace, I accept your challenge. Sometimes, the face of life is but a mocking lie. Oh, 
November 20, 1926. Roses de Noël from a friend of humble origins. Oh, it masks out the unfinished work covered in black cloth, work guided by delusion. Uh, <laughs> that spring, that spring, I, up for a walk, I saw a man at a cafe having his day's end aperitif and was dirty velvet breeches and clumsy subbolts and in his hand, in his hand, a small bouquet of white flowers. Oh, to have been a woman. May 8th, the First Lady of Rhode Island, well, she being the sister of Governor Theodore Francis Green, bought my Negro head. And she called it one of her art treasures. And she, she, she wrote about it. It is called Fourth High Praise from my family and relations as to fine in conception, powerful workmanship and its living quality. Its living quality, she donated it to the Rhode Island School of Design Museum for their permanent collection. These things are there, you should go and see them, please. Well, there was still the need to cover expenses. And so I reached out to Louise Brooks of the Student Fund of Boston in June 1927. And, well, I remember snatches of the letter. I, I want to work. This is no vain idea, but a fire that burns within. Uh, it, it's a force that compels my obedience. It's a force stronger than me. But ever in the face of what may seem discouraging conditions, I, I cannot stop. I must go on. I'm a fighter. I match myself with life's forces. I only stop when I drop. But this thing, money, or the lack of it, it's crushing. It keeps me from working. I, I know sculpture is an expensive medium. I've not chosen my work. It has chosen me. I want to work. I want to work. I want to. I live for that alone. Oh, forgive me for writing to you this way, I beg you. I'm driven to desperation. Elizabeth Prophet. Well, that letter gone for me. $30 a month for the next two years. Today, that would be $400 a month for the next two years. <clears throat> the true work of art is the creation, not in the hands, but in the mind and the soul of the artist and starvation. Mm -hmm. That stomach growling while the third annual exhibition of the Boston Society of the Independent Artists displayed my head of Cossack in the Boston Salon of the Independent Exposition. Oh, the wild starvation. Beauty is conceived in paradise, but it is formed in the depths of hell. March 1929, I am 39. I will not bend an inch. With the sale of a piece of my work, I sent the man I married off to America. The end of that epoch, in a strength, obtained this. Then, cutting stone again, in touch with myself, an Argentinian friend sat for me, Boost Don, the Boston man. Um, Poise, they called it. Well, uh, it was my first piece that I sent to Société des Artistes Français was accepted. It was accepted. And they spoke of its intensity and outer calm. 
society. <laughs> well, they were an old salon, an old salon, 1970, but they attracted many Americans. My exhibit in Société des Artistes Françaises. Oh gosh, it was a tea, but there was more than tea being poured. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and all oh, the guests. I hope oh, some guests were left over from Candy's party, this card party the day before. The guests I cannot recall all the names. Oh, too many. Uh, well, uh, artist Palmer Hayden and the great Hill Woodruff. Dr. Gertrude Curtis Thompson, first African-American woman dentist, invited us all to her place over in Montmartre for July 4th cabbage and ribs. And uh, Zadie Jackson, the uh, actress, singer, dancer, day, was planning another cocktail party. Oh, there was so many. They were planning a Martin Machine Ball. And, uh, no one was surprised that seven years in France, I still knew what my colored artists were doing in America, what they were performing, producing, and doing. You know, County, my dear friend County Cullen, he married Du Bois' daughter by his first wife, Nina Goma, and when they all realized that County was gay. The poor girl was inconsolable. Her mother whisked her off to Paris. County Cullen, handsome debonair County Cullen. Key figures in the Harlem Renaissance were gay or lesbian. And they were exemplary artists forced to hide who they were. Well, some of them didn't and were beautifully flamboyant and proud. Yes, but the prejudice was a shame. Soul lynching, lynching of souls who came to this earth like anyone else. It's how one treats one, how one treats others, how well one answers one's destiny. We are great and beautiful in proportion to the greatness and beauty that we can bring into our work and into the world to others. What it gives to others. Love, love, the genie of life, givers of sorrows, Happiness and terror sublime. County and I, we discovered art at great length. And later that year, I wrote to him that it is useless for us to be proud of showing that we can build up a form, build up a form like other people, if that form has no reason to be. Now, why it seems to me that the Negro has something more than petty grievances or, or prejudices or light pleasures to express. Because I do believe that there is something underneath, something underneath more vital. While the Negro had not education, he sang spirituals. Now that he has it, it should facilitate that expression. Well, that September, I received a letter from W.E.B. Augusta Savage, colored woman sculptor, arrives for a study on the France on September 6th. Would appreciate advice and guidance. Du Bois. Well, I persisted in casting my own work. I persisted in heavy material, lifting things. So my reply was, at present I am in bed with a sprained back, but as soon as I'm able, I will try to undertake that which you ask of me. But I beg you not to expect too much of me, for I am facing a great undertaking. I am very weary. My kindest regards to Mrs. Du Bois. Oh, yeah. 
then I don't miss it to boys. Um, I received Miss Savage, who I found very sweet. But I'm still in bed with this wretched back. Kind wishes and much appreciation for your invitation. And I, you know, I sent her photos and articles for Du Bois's magazines and others, and I hated these articles. But they might stave stay off starvation. Augustus Savage's talent was exquisite. At the time, our work employed the same methods. And I arranged for her to work in my first atelier, 36 Avenue de Chatignon in Montparnasse. And then from 1929 to 1931, we, together, visited West Indians and Africans and poor through colored magazines and looked at all the critiques. And, and we were among the first to create art celebrating our African heritage. October of 1929, after a draining preparation, I set off for my first visit to America. <laughs> Eleven months, I would be there on the ocean liner. I set off on the ocean liner. Oh, yeah, that powerful, beautiful, oh, ocean, glorious ocean. I, I wrote to County back, that was back in Paris, and I wrote that I have landed here without a single emotion. It speaks to me in no way that I adored that great and powerful ocean. I would have been content and flattered to have been lapped up by its cruel and powerful tongue. Oh, to be in the arms, moments in the arms of a love like that. Oh, God, what recompense. But, shame not to have been taken by the sea. Alone, oh, I feel just feel so indifferent since parting with the city. Well, he whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. Yes, but I was graciously and generously hosted by Madame Dubois in their new uh, Rockefeller Dunbar apartments. Among social circles of Harlem, I was well received. I met oh, so many, Roland Hayes, composer, lyric composer, and uh, handsomest man in Harlem, Harold Jackman, parading around. <laughs> and oh, I've got to uh, permit, a Museum of Modern Art, a sketch permit. Then in 1930, while I was still in New York, month after I turned 40, discontent, my head and wood. It sold for $1,000, which today that would be $14,000 from the 56th Street Gallery, and was bought by Ellen Sharp and Eleanor Green and accepted by the Rhode Island School of Design Museum, RISD Museum, yes. Now, AutoCon. AutoCon had awarded me a prize for the head of a Negro in the Harmon Foundation show. He had viewed my bust, it been my bust, ebony bust at the Société des Artistes Français, and I applied to him for $2,000. $28,000 today. Otto Kahn, the board of the chair of the Met, the vice president of the Philharmonic, Princeton, Art and Archaeology, American Federation of Art Department Store, Maven, living two-minute walk from the stock exchange awarded me $250. Well, today that's $3,500.
to live in Paris for a year. Yes. Well, August by August 22nd, 1930, August, uh, I was 40, back in Paris with $500, $7,000 today, to live in Paris for a year. Mm. Uh, by November, I heard from Du Bois, my dear Du Bois. Dear Elizabeth, I have your letter and I am glad you are hard at work. I can understand very well the, 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 the thrill that you must get in cutting marble and the sense of work marking sort of a combination of art and effort. Creation accompanied by hard physical movement must be rather splendid. I received the book and I shall read it. I hope you're going after the Rose Wall of Guggenheim people good and hard. And I'll see that your bust gets to the Hummen exhibit with love and best regards. Love and best regards. At January. My dear Dr. Dubois, do you know that I've been frankly ill with a grip and I've got better than this cold in the studio trying to do things for myself, gave me a relapse, and a neighbor got me into the hospital. I almost had something ready to send to the New York Gallery, but I had to give it up. And I'm so glad to have your lecture, which came yesterday. And reading it, perhaps I shall love you again. Because I read your little note, and I feel myself weakening to it. But my heart, my heart tightens, tightens. I'm, I know what life has been to you. I want to love you always, but you, and remember, I too have suffered and suffer. And let us not strike each other. You paid for the passage of the bus. Tell me what it is, please. And what Otto Kahn did was a pernicious thing. And I long, long to believe in any of them. Louise Brooks's parade was only vanity. My grit comes from having worried myself into a state to receive anything. Ah, oh, my letter, it sounds depressed, but it is only the grip, so forgive it, please. And in a month, few months, penniless still, I wrote him, that I would either come through or go under if no one else cared, neither did I. Well, I read his response to that over many, many times. Circled in my mind, circled in my mind. He felt that I, what, that something about my attitude, thinking his attitude and his actions and the actions of the colored people and their attitude towards my work, he assured me that they work in so far as they knew my work, it, it, they loved. That, that for him, I was an artist, a great artist, and it is, I didn't understand, he said, the conditions in America, the situation in America, that six million, maybe 10 million people were out of work, and there were bread lines everywhere, and all support had stopped, all support, and it, well, him, he was no great friend of the foundations, his work, his unpopular writings, and people were inimical to him. And he said, I must realize that this is the face of genius. And I realize that this is what people like me have to go through too often. This is the price we have to pay. And I hope you will write to me from time to time, he said. Continue to write to me from time to time. Well, he raised funds for me from time to time. He raised, he did his utmost. And yet, and yes, 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 yes. Bits and pieces of my letter to my dear Dr. Dubois. Ah. <laughs> I'm no longer angry with you, my dear. 
Mm. Oh, tonight I'm writing because I'm, I'm not cross or scolding the world, but because tonight I love you. May, May. Uh, oh, how wonderful, how delightful it would be if you would, if you could spend a few moments together. In November. Oh, how wonderful it would be if you would come to Paris, beautiful Paris, wonderful France, and, and I can never forget you. And I see you ever courageously working at your work. I love you admire you, but I have been through many phases since we parted. I wrote him and others, L'Exposition Coloniale Internationale de Paris, 1931, the International Colonial Exposition celebrating French colonialism. Mm -hmm. They staged exhibits from all over the French-controlled colonies, and they revealed exquisite cultures in the Caribbean and the Pacific and the Africa. But how dare the French or any other country claim art that is not of their birthing? I was enthralled by them all, but arrested by the African exhibit. I wrote, the heads there are such mental development that are rarely seen among Europeans. Heads of thought and reflection, types of great beauty and dignity of carriage. People are seeing the aristocracy of Africa. <laughs> millennia, centuries of inspiration, awakened from wood, stone, clay, grasses, and other natural elements in the jungles, the plains, sculptures capturing the sheer essence of life in their world from birth to death and beyond. These sculptures, seemingly simple yet emanating with powerful magnitude, the engagement of the soul, awe-filled figures compelling respect, sculptures smooth, calm, and trancing, infusing peace within the viewer, the serenity of ageless wisdom in the countenance of these hand-wrought heads speaking through these inspired artists, Africans who see and know to deify every force of nature, these souls who interpret the sanctity, the surety of the source of life. Yes. Well, in America, the art of Africa was transmitted through the enslaved. Yes. Next. Year 1932, five months later, my second visit to America that July, <laughs> I was invited to join the Art Association of Newport, a member of the Art Association of Newport. And I met the Newport Museum founder, Maud Howe Elliott, activist daughter of the abolitionist and suffragette. Julia Ward Howe, who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic, hits. I was guest of Miss Agnes Storrs, who had her eye upon developing that Newport waterfront then, and Mrs. Emily Post, syndicated columnist. Dear Emily invited me to her Carmelite Chapel. All of these were a few of the things that I did. What a joyous reception. 21st annual exhibit of the Newport Art Association. 1932, my silence, poets, Congolais, peace, discontent, lined the entrance hall, greeting the many, many excited guests. Oh, I could never name them all now. Oh, there was one. Mrs. Sheldon Whitehouse, 
I believe you know the grandson. Yes. You're a big wig in politics or something. Yes. Well, I was a big wig then. I was a big wig then. Because I won. I won the grand prize for my discontent. <laughs> that, that County Cullen had called the very spirit of rebellion, the very spirit of revolt and rebellion. And the critics called it a sculpture in every sense of the word. The New York Times, <laughs> they reported an Indian woman and Elizabeth Prophet. And the Newport Digest and the Newport Herald wrote, Negress wins first prize in Newport. <laughs> and uh, first prize for an Indian woman. <laughs> but I won. I won. But still in the following weeks, still waiting anxiously for a sale. And then, my Congolais, my Congolais was inspired <coughs> by the African heads at L'Exposition Internationale Coloniale, was purchased by my dear friend, my dear art patron, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, for her permanent collection in the Whitney Museum. It is there today, go and see. Africa prevailed. <laughs> And in October 1932, that October, I was featured on in Du Bois' Crisis magazine. That was one of the five articles that he published on me. Then in November, the Robert Bowes Gallery in Boston displayed Boost de Ben, and that was the Boston Ebony. He who loves and seeks beauty must acquire the power to produce it from within. He would have perfection, must attain that quality in his own creation. And so to attain this, one must seek as instructor the great universal creator, for only there is the true power. Well, by May of 1933, I was back in Paris and cutting stone, a 1,200 block of stone. And in, oh, in August, W.E.B. W. E. B. wrote, my dear Elizabeth, Mrs. Dubois, received this just before she went off on her vacation. Uh, I send, would send her letters, yes, and her photos and whatnot. And <clears throat> on her vacation, after, after great trials, and tribulations. And I've got Rwanda and the baby down in Philadelphia with Dr. Alexander for two weeks and Nina in Spring Lake for two weeks so that both would get a little rest. I, I wish you would write me and let me know how things are getting on. They were pretty bad, but perhaps not as quite as bad as when you were here. Uh, we often talk of you very sincerely, yours. The family is the embryo of the nation. Winter, 1933, again lacking, lacking anxieties, anxieties. And well, the Minister of France of Finance gave me $300, and today that is $6,000, but it, and it lasted six months. Madame Chanteau, my concierge, my proprietor, she fed and, and heated my studio on credit for the winter. Oh, 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 to command and create from all that comes within my range of feeling, thought, and vision. And, and then again, again, I wondered how the young colored artists, or the, the women artists, in America, how would they eventually fare?
that next February, 1934, yes, winter dragged on, anxious, was anxious. So I began pulling down the petitions in a corner of my studio to open up this small corner where, where, where I had sometimes slept and, and sometimes eaten and, you know, and fought for those not years. And now, it, it, it would be a large studio. And Madame Chanton, she rented me upstairs for a small studio, quiet at last, after nine years of all kinds of hellishness and bedlam over my head, day and night, from all manner of, of brutes and devotees. And, oh, finally, peace at last. Well, March 19, 1934, I am 44. March 19, 1934, I am 44. March 30, 1934, we see the refusal of the Guggenheim Fellowship. So onward, transforming my apartment, my studios, and early morning to midnight, I tore down the petitions, I saw, I split, I stacked the winter woods, and two coats of paint on all the walls, all the way, Madame Chanton, I owe her 10,000 francs. She loans me 5,000 francs. I put in electric, I put in heating, I, I put in the plumbing, and then, in a month, I'm sitting in my little studio upstairs. <laughs> it is quite charming, quite peaceful. I, I'm going on. Where? Money? I have begun a large statue. Le Prince Sublime, the Sublime Prince. It, it is, it, it is just defiance. Junior, Edward Champion, they know my condition. They are alarmed at my business condition. They remove and withdraw all their support. I understand. I understand. I know I understand. I understand. Zero dollars for pennies. I understand. A few months. A gift. A lovely raspberry velvet trap. Sparkling buttons, <laughs> coquettish. <laughs> A package of tea, orange marmalade. <laughs> How enticing to an empty stomach. There's no meat, no bread, but just to gaze on and caress a lovely velvet wrap is nourishment. And finally, Madame Champion, she bent to my awkward request for rent. University to be the first African American woman to teach in the Atlantic University Center system. <laughs> Teaching at Spelman, and I had an expertise in sculpture and art history and art and architecture from the Paleolithic to the modern, criticism, aesthetics, and methods of visual analysis, and I longed for Paris. Uh, this new environment had held many challenges. 
And I'm sure of my acceptance and place I often kept to myself while I was considered mysterious. Uh, some of my students enjoyed our evenings together, our gatherings, our discussions, and, and I delivered a lecture, a formal lecture, in Du Bois's class. Um, African American black artists living in Paris. Uh, 1939, it brought the grand opening of my studio, my sculpture studio in the power plant at Spelman for building classes and exhibits in my office and, and my own. <laughs> yes, I mounted exhibits of heads and masks and bas relief and batik and, and I organized two shows, rare pieces, foreign and domestic, and among them was a loose cloak, a loose cloak in French broadcloth with steel cut beads from my grandmother, my Narragansett Pequot grandmother. Yes. Yes. Well, there were students, artists, and community artists. It was rated the best in five years. The 1941 was far removed from the professional milieu. The ideas differed radically, and Southern prejudice was pure evil, pure evil. It is difficult to believe that human beings could be proud in such a tragic plight as that of the Negroes. In my article, Art and Life, I wrote, intelligent America and her educators are attempting to give some cultural education to the people, but this can no longer be neglected if America is to take her place in the civilized world. I resigned Spelman in 1934, shortly after the voice, and Providence was bleak. Well, there was factory work, making ceramic Indian heads and busts, and I, uh, I am exhibiting member of the Salons of America and American Anderson Galleries in New York, who showed in 56th Street Galleries, Nine Works, Philadelphia Museum of Art, Howard University, Milch Galleries, and Boston Society of the Independent Artists, the Boston Dolls Gallery, Whitney, Elsewhere, Permanent Collections, Whitney, Rhode Island School of Design, Brooklyn Museum of Art, 1939, Who's Who in American Art, and among my admirers, Mrs. Randolph Hearst, Mills, Millie, not Millicent, Millie Hurst, my friend, my admirer, Mrs. Vincent Astor, Helen. There was no teaching work in Providence. I was insane to work. Mental and spiritual strength is greater through the physical. Mental and spiritual strength is greater through the... Mental and... Physical strength is greater through the spiritual. I joined the Assumption Church. The altar was boarded Benedict Street, half a block from my father's house. Father, there was no teaching work in Providence, Father. I cared for my father with it back back and running back and forth to New York in my studio and he saw my work. 1945, Providence Public Library. He saw my mask of him. My mask. My terracotta mask of him, bronzed. Before he left me in 1954 with an unfinished bust for dad and his house on Benedict Street, half a block from the altar of Assumption Church. Oh, after my passing, St. Joseph's Hospital made a parking lot, demolishing a house that contained 27 of my pieces. <coughs> a few of them survived. Where are they? RISD President Gilbert. Gilbert Franklin, he retrieved my French and Indian tools from my Benedict house after my passing. Where are they? 
France had long since destroyed pieces I could not afford to transport. Spellman hounded me to retrieve my school, my sculpture, tools, it's everything. But I had hospital bills for back pain. And suddenly the power plant at Spellman was cleaned out. Everything gone, gone. Like some dusky raven, weighing through the night with a gruesome graveyard to cheer its appetite. Well, shortly after spewing out ceramic Indian heads in a Rhode Island factory, I was embroidering. I was embroidering in the Rhode Island Mental Hospital to calm my nerves. I was determined. Once out, I was living in a cooked, clean, decorated case for the Providence Commissioner of Education in six weeks, fired by his wife. Masked, I made of his children, gone, gone, gone. There comes a time when the body becomes, in County Cullen's words, the broken debris of the abandoned, frustrated travail of many transient sculptors. Oh, Father. Oh, Holy Father. Holy Who am I? And what? I feel so terribly alone. I am unfinished work. Yes, yes, you have given me much. December 13, 1960 in my father's home, half a block from the Assumption Church altar. Oh! 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 No. I will not relive that. In spite of it all, I had gone on. I would go on. I continued to go on. In spite of it all, I live. I live. Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, Narragansett Pequot, African American, African American, Narragansett Pequot, sculptor, I live. You know me. I live. It is just. Just defiance. Just defiance. charge of special collections at Rhode Island College and also the Nancy Lee Prophet special collection from whence came the Mahai. <laughs> it's so good to see all these wonderful people. Um,
most of these, the majority of these images, um, came from Veronica College. You can tell them about that. Yeah, so go ahead and okay. talk to some, and also George and whatever you have to say. Okay. Thank you. Um, Rhode Island College is very fortunate to have the Nancy Elizabeth Prophet collection. And the way that we got the materials was in uh, was as a result of an ethnic heritage project that took place at Rhode Island College in the late 70s to early 80s. And what it did is it, it gathered uh, materials from representatives of every ethnic group in Rhode Island. And so it happened that there were a number of people who had material that was connected to Nancy Elizabeth Prophet. So, for example, one was Mr. Williamson, who was re, uh, one of the people responsible for starting the Urban League. He had some material, materials. Uh, we had some other things from George Prophet, who was a cousin of Nancy Elizabeth Prophet. And there were others. So what we have mainly are photographs. Mm -hmm. But the value of the photographs is that many of them are of works that so far as we know, are no longer in existence. At least they may be in private hands someplace, but the public does not know about them. So it's pictures of the works, most of them done in France, and um, signed on the back of the photographs. Uh, and there were also personal pictures, as you might have noticed, pictures of Nancy Elizabeth Prophet in the ages. We also have a bronze version of the bust that is at, at RISD. And we have the mask that was shown here, the mask that probably was of her father. Though, it, though it's signed, it doesn't have a title. So what I wanted to do today, however, is to announce, and I have these little flyers that I'll, I'll give to anyone who's interested, but Rhode Island College has been uh, involved, like a lot of other libraries, in digitizing its collections. So I'm happy to say that all of the Nancy Elizabeth Prophet uh, photographs are now available to anyone who has access to the internet. So on this uh, piece of paper, it will give you the exact address to go to Shared Shelf and be able to see the pictures. So these pictures are available for personal and educational purposes. as a whole should be put under the name and the purview of George Prophet as a member of the family. So George Prophet initially set up a number of rules regarding the use of the collection, including the fact that no one could use any of the photographs, whether it was for a book or for uh, uh, a show or anything else, without the permission of the library at Rhode Island College and without his permission. Now, not surprisingly, this got to be a burden for him after you know, 20 years or so. So he then gave permission to the school to do as we deemed appropriate with the pictures. So that's how um, we got them, and that's how we're giving them back to you. Is there more? Uh, do you have any questions for Molly? Yes. My other question on the um, the Negro head at RISD, and when we're touring that with persons coming in, um, is that actually um, a prototypic role of her husband, or is it not? Because I hear different stories about that. Well, I think I started that role. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you why I did, but we don't know. It's, it's not said anywhere, but of course people in the future are going to read because now they start the rumor that, it, you know, hopefully they'll say maybe when they type it in. But uh, I was looking around for an image of her husband 
and it, because he went to Brown, I went to the alumni place, and um, and I saw him, and I thought, oh my God, it looks like him. But her husband looks more, he doesn't look as serious. He really doesn't look, he looks more kind of, you know, happy or something. So uh, I shouldn't have said that, you know, because we don't know for sure. But there were many others, you know, there were many other, she saw many other African men, because that, that Negro head is pretty African looking. Her grandfather was African, on a paternal side. And on the maternal side, could, could very well have been African, because that was its time of, of enslavement. Um, I don't think we, I forget, 1834, there's not supposed to be any more slavery in Rhode Island, but please. But still, there were people coming from Africa. So that, that Negro head is pretty African looking, and there's, she has something in there that was not in her husband's face at all in any of his photos. So, anyway. And I would like to add to that a, a general comment is that, which is that in the photographs that we have, often the piece is not made or it's given one, more, one name on one picture and another name mm -hmm. on the other. So there's a lot of uh, room for interpretation. That was the case with poverty, because mm -hmm. somebody decided, because she was like this, to call it prayer. She never calls it prayer in her diary or anywhere else. She calls it poverty. So I decided to take prayer out and just leave it as poverty, because you know, that's what I decided. Um, I, I would like to say that um, well, first of all, this is a chronological palette. You probably read that in the program. Uh, in other words, it is, you know, this is not the play. This is a jumping off from the play. I have about 40 something pages of ideas from way when I was first starting, I could hear things going through my head and I started just jotting things down. Ideas of, of, uh, of sounds, you know, sculpture, chipping sounds, crumbling plaster, crumbling play, uh, music, more music, certainly not the blues, that gorgeous blues, that you know, that wasn't the right era, but I loved it, and he was saying the right things, so I used it for this, this time. There were the visuals, um, the visuals would be um, totally different. I put the PowerPoint together, in, uh, I guess one night, um, for, to have it, for a July, uh, for something else, for reading. And then I thought, I, I, you know, I'm keeping this because it's too stressful. <laughs> you know, is, are the things going to come through or not? And I had a zillion things going on in my life, which were far <coughs> worse than that sound of coming in. So, but, you know, so it was really about August, at the end of August. I'm like, you know, this, this is going to be this chronological thing because bringing her story is basically what it is. Now the play that, you know, there would not be, there's not going to be a lot of talking, um, you know, like lecture talking. Um, it's gonna be a, a different kind of, of verbalization. And that, who knows what the, the, I mean, we know that we've seen filmy hangings with images on them. We've seen, you know, uh, on the entire back wall being an image. It all depends if somebody picks this up, when it's done, and how much money that theater has. Um, I, there, there, I mean, there are sets, sets that are actually um, images of projections. And, um, so, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things that can happen with it. Uh, it. It was very interesting to work on it because I had to get together two crates. You see, when you're not well known, or you're not known, or you're not an institution, well, you gotta do all your stuff yourself, which, okay. So, um, you know, I, I, I needed a seat, so I got a couple of crates and put them together and threw some cloth over it and uh, all these different things. And Milo found that downstairs for me because I did have a, a cardboard thing that some, some runner, rug runner had come in. I'm like, oh, that's going to be my pedestal. Um, there's, there are a lot of things that can happen. There can be things, you know, hung, <coughs> instruments hung. So, you know, this, Residency right now for me is over. 
And so now there's no do do do, and I've got a bunch of things happening up, uh, coming up. So um, I'm going to be working at leisure on my own, quietly um, incorporating the ideas and whatnot. So yeah, so there I'm sure there are more. Well, whatever you have questions by now. Yes. Well, we saw you do a previous performance, like an earlier version of this, and you've enriched it so much. I mean, like it's like it was good then, but this is um, what what you've added to it is, is wonderful. Well, good. Well, thank you. I'll keep that in mind to keep to keep it in, even though it may be a different format. To, you know. I, I'm going to ask, did you have a question, Jay? No, I was just wondering about her reputation in America nowadays. Because I would never heard of her, not that I know that much about sculpture. But, um, Thank you for to, asking that. Has, that's has her work become more valuable over the years or well, more they, obscure? Well, they can't find it. <laughs> and um, she has been spoken about. Um, and, and there are things published. There's a book, if you want to read more about her. Um, I'm, New Negro Artist. I'm shortening the title. New Negro Artist. If you just put a New Negro Artist, Teresa, if you want to remember Lina Camilla, remember that too. But, but that her book will come up. So, so there are things. But that, that's, that's um, I'm thinking two things at one time. Because you were reading it. You say various pieces are in various collections. So, oh okay, yeah, I know what I was going to say. Okay. You know, do they, are they more valuable than they were, you know, 60? Well, I don't know how much. Well, I, I, the Boston, uh, the Brooklyn Museum of Art a couple of years ago found one of her pieces. I didn't ask them how much they paid. I, I should have. I mean, I could have. Or well, you can find out online. But they contacted me and, and brought me down and they wanted me to to come and do a dramatic reading of her diary, which is, which is what I do and which is what we saw. And, um, and, and so it was very interesting because, you know, trying to get stuff here, you know, somebody's gonna give you a hundred bucks or you're gonna get me, 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 or whatever. And so they asked me how much money I wanted. I didn't know what to ask, but I really didn't want to, you know, spoil my chances. So I thought about it and thought about it and I just, um, you know, uh, how about, a thousand dollars, and they were like, "Okay." I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But they were very incredible because they put me up, and I stayed a couple of days so I could go to the Whitney and see the piece and, and see some friends in New York. And so when I handed in my invoice, I, you know, pointed out what my charges because it came with bills and cards. I can't remember. But my charges for my time in New York that I spent in cabs and, and other things, and I separated that out from what they, it you know cost me to get to that, and they they paid for the whole thing. They paid. They were they were really so. Uh, you know, there's also <coughs> Merton Simpson Gallery went out, of, went out of business, which is really sad, and uh, and they thought in the world these pieces went, but somebody tried to had a piece that looked like the, the ebony bust that you saw, but the head, the nose was cut off. And they, they're saying that that was hers. And some woman said he, she didn't want to buy, buy it, this gallery art, because she said it, I don't know. Um, <laughs> it was too scary. Um, so I, we don't know where this stuff is. But that, that's a, thank you for bringing that up, because I wanted to know who knew, how many of you knew, and I know none of the people that are left in the back row, they didn't know. Of Nancy, I know, I know them. And, um, they didn't. Um, who knew that Nancy Elizabeth Prophet existed? Can you just raise your hand? One. Okay. <laughs> um, four. Five. Okay. I'm just. This is just. It's a big estimate, you know. But that's the way it goes. And and knew who knew all this about her? <laughs> something about it. What, what do you, is there a significance? Uh, what, what do you think her significance is in, in, in the history of Rhode Island? Is there some, or is there some, can you? 
the um, sculpture of the head of a Negro sculpture in the Misty Museum. Every time I go there, it's like it speaks to you. It's, it's powerful. It's, and it's, it's right in one of the first rooms you go into in the museum. Well, also, the, uh, <coughs> the Providence Art Club <coughs> had uh, several exhibits of hers, and at one point she was not invited to the, the exhibit. Um, so this must have been in the 30s, I guess, when uh, she had an exhibit to me. How do you know that? Well, I'm a docent at Christie, and we've had many, many lectures over a period of time from the curators and curatorial staff. So that was one that always, and I've done some reading on it. Give tours, but I agree with what this lady is saying that um, you give tours whether they're young children, I mean, they can be kindergartners all the way up to, to women coming from all over the country and men coming from all over the country for um, tours from different museums and whatever. And often, when you go through the 20th Century Gallery or wherever you're going in the other galleries, she's there, that Negro head is there. And, um, the children, there are so many children that don't miss that as they go through, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and adults as well. But just um, inquiring minds, or even if we don't stop at that piece, is um, one that seems to be highlighted by the students. So I'd like to ask you about the, the, the art club. A, a person from the art club came and said that? No, I think that was more that um, I might have read that somewhere, or but I'm, I'm assuming that it was from where I heard it mostly, was from the, a curator at RISD. A curator at RISD? At RISD. Yeah, I need to find out because I never saw that in written down, and I'm very curious about that because I haven't seen anywhere in the research that exhibit where they told her she could not stand by the book. Oh, so I didn't want to. Well, perhaps I. Perhaps I, I want to make anything up. Uh, but I. I know I've used that uh, several times. So I. I well. Uh, well, if I see it, tell me you found it or something. Yeah. Else. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll leave your name. I'll write your name down here. And I'll could, could I say a little yeah. bit? Yeah. I often get questions uh, about the the use of the oh, collection. So partly to answer what you were asking about how well known is she. I can say that we've received requests from a number of people who are create authors who are creating books of either uh, artists or of African American women and they want to include her. I also had someone who was in Paris making a film about uh, Americans in Paris in the 20s and they wanted to include her. So I think that there, there is some knowledge of her, and I think there will be more. We've also gotten a request from the gallery when someone brought in a piece claiming it was from um, Nancy Elizabeth Prophet. So we supplied pictures, because we had two pictures done at different times of the same piece. And so from that, they were able to make a decision about the piece that was going up for auction. So I think there might even be growing interest in Nancy Elizabeth Prophet. Professional Right, right. And, and in regard to uh, her being denied uh, or not invited to a showing that included her own work, I have to say, I am not a scholar of Nancy Elizabeth Prophet. I am a librarian and curator of, the, of our, our um, special collection. But the only incident that I've heard of that was way in the beginning, the one that you mentioned, where she was not really welcome to attend, but that was early on. I have not heard of, had heard of anything that late as the 1930s. But I yeah, I'm not sure I'm not so. Is Maybe in the yeah. series? I believe I'm so. That, that's my perception. Well, that, she does say that in her diary, yeah. that mm -hmm. I was not allowed to stand at these right. my work or something. Well, we'll look into, look into mm -hmm. that. But you know, we, it's kind of dark, so uh, is anybody, if people have something to add, please raise your hand or, or uh, speak out. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. I just, you asked 
what is the significance of her story? I don't remember exactly how you phrased it. Um, for that Rhode Island and black history and black history in Rhode Island or people of color history in Rhode Island or why is this story important? For me, I think there are a number of reasons that her story is important. First of all, very specifically, it shows um, the, how people of color in Rhode Island are actually made up. So the fact that she's married man to Pequot and African American is so, um, you know, you're not gonna find that in Texas. Um, which is, is really, you know, so significant. And oftentimes people weren't necessarily one or, or they were seen as colored, right? So you didn't necessarily know till you get into the reading. And the fact that she's writing in her own words, uh, a woman of color at that time period, that we have her actual words is also significant because it's not her experience through the lens of anybody else. Um, and to get a sense of what a woman of color at that time from this region where we live, you know, where I grew up, uh, and what her journey is to try to make it as an artist in this place that we consider the creative capital now. Um, you know, what were her struggles to really be herself? And I think, Sylvia, you do such a really fine job on that piece, like the drive for her to do her art, this gift that she's been given, and how hard, how hard it is for artists in general, and, and how hard it is for artists of color, and particularly how hard it is for women artists of color. Um, that's probably not. Thank you. <laughs> you can go with me. I had a in the market, and I'm going to sweet potatoes, and you know they're very large, and this one rolled right down the faucet and right on my shelf. <laughs> it's been two weeks, but it's still good. It's Yeah.